Disrupting and diverting gang culture to prevent rising knife crime. Hello and welcome to the penultimate webinar in our series. I'm pleased to say that the series is proving popular, hundreds of professionals registering and participating. Today, we are taking a glimpse into a world that few of us, thankfully, will ever get close to, but one that can wreak havoc with children and young people. We'll hear moving testimony from a reformed gang member who is now a passionate campaigner dedicated to helping prevent violent crime and exploitation. Before I introduce our speaker panel, I must remind you of some housekeeping points. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All the tools are resizable and movable, so please feel free to move them around. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions for our speakers during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. We'll try to answer these in a panel session at the end of the presentations with Embrace Chief Executive Anne Campbell. But if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered via email. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing on the unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. The webinar is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headsets are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are being pined, push F5 on your keyboard and it will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that you use to access this session. Now, back to today. Dr. Jackie Sabir is the Chief Officer protecting vulnerable people across Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire. She also leads for the National Police Chiefs Council on Violent Crime. She is a former colleague of mine, so I know just how passionate Jackie is, not just about her work, but about the charity we hold so very dear to our hearts. Embrace Seabrook. Jackie was instrumental in the setting up of the Bedfordshire Violence and Exploitation Reduction Unit, which is doing outstanding work, galvanising partners to work together for its common aims. Following Jackie is Sheldon Thomas, a renowned expert on gangs and gang culture. Sheldon's experience comes from being once a key member of a London-based gang, who has now joined the effort to reduce violence on the streets. Questions can be emailed in at any point during the presentations. Hello everybody and a very very warm welcome to this section of the webinar which is all about protecting young people by tackling violence and reducing exploitation. And in my opinion one of the greatest risks to our young people is exploitation by criminal gangs and then them being caught up in the subsequent violence and, and cycle of violence and vulnerability that results in that. So my name is Jackie Sabir and I'm the ACC, so the Assistant Chief Constable for Protective Services for Bedfordshire, Hertfordshire and Cambridgeshire. But also I have another day job which is the uh, Serious Violence Coordinator, particularly focusing on vulnerability for uh, all of uh, England and Wales Chief Police Officers. And it's in that regard that I, I'm speaking to you today. So... I thought over the next 10 minutes, what would be quite helpful to do is sort of set the scene. Let's look at the context around the numbers and the trends, because we do hear so many statistics, don't we? And then we'll look a bit about what we know, what's driving these numbers. And then probably the most important of the part of the presentation today is all about, well, what are we doing about it? What works? What can we do? Um, and how does our responsibility sit in, in driving innovation and different ideas and supporting our young people? 
So let's look at the numbers and you can see that um, from the slide that we've had so many headlines. I don't think a week or a day goes by when we don't hear about the serious injury, the violence or um, a homicide of a young person. And it's the nature and scale of this, this serious violence that's obviously caused so much concern and heartache for our communities. So in March 2020, um, that year we're up to sort of 46,000 knife crimes. That's the highest since records began. And we often hear this title, since records began. But those records began just after the Second World War. So we've got decades and decades of issues and challenges to unpick to try and understand why these levels of violence are at their highest level. Homicide is now up 12% and what's particularly heartbreaking about that is that the main uh, area of that rise in homicide has been between the 16 and 25 year old age cohort and it's not just confined to London or Birmingham or the, the big metropolitan cities. We have seen violence knife crime and the, the vulnerability associated with that spread out through all communities, rural and urban, and particularly in the sort of smaller seaside and market towns where the tentacles of county lines uh, have spread out. I've been a police officer for 27 years now, coming up to 28, and, and we've always been in a situation where people are violent towards each other, people stab each other, people get into trouble. That, that's what policing is. But what's, what's very different for me in, in this phenomenon that we're witnessing is the age of the victims and the criminals, or the perpetrators, I should say. They're very young. You know, we've got kids as young as 12, we're dealing drugs on the streets. Normally, I would have been dealing with 12-year-old shoplifting. So the, the age of, of, of children caught up in very, very serious levels of criminality is extraordinary. So the age is one thing that's different about this phenomenon, but also the spread. Like I said, it, it's rural, it's urban, it's, it's within seaside and market towns. So, but the, the same issues and challenges are being replicated across England and Wales. So that's what makes this so, so very different from, from what we, we have experienced before. So what's driving this? What, what, is, what is driving our young people to, to have this phenomenon where, where many children and young people caught up in, in this violence are both sometimes victims and perpetrators? There's this real cross-section of vulnerability that, that has drawn young people in, into, the, into this um, spiral of serious violence. So let's unpick some of these drivers in the next slide. I think probably in my opinion and, and the research tells us that actually the drugs market, that criminal exploitation by drugs gangs is one of the key proponents driving these rises in serious violence. And that happens through a number of, a number of reasons. The, the organized criminals will use violence to bring, to co-opt young people in, to act as drug runners, to make people use their products to settle debts, to, to have power and control, both internally within their own areas, but also as they're exploiting, to try and uh, exporting, to try and find new areas, to, you know, to, to go into new boroughs, new postcodes, new areas to exploit the, the fertile drugs market. So there is no, no doubt in my mind that drugs play an absolutely significant factor in fueling the serious violence. Many of you will have heard of the county lines model. It, it is a business model, pure and simple, really. It, it's a way that um, organized criminal gangs exploit young and very vulnerable people to send them out into different areas to sell their drugs, to transfer drugs between the, um, the trap houses where they're made and packaged and then send them out to other areas because people are less likely to potentially stop children. If children do get stopped, um, they're less likely to get a criminal penalty. So, and, and they're much easier to threaten and control as a workforce. And sadly, if, if I think of my home force, Bedfordshire, we know that the, the money the criminal gangs bring in through the um, sale of cannabis and cocaine is in the hundreds of millions of pounds. And it's certainly more than my policing budget 
to be able to do to deal with it. So it's a massive challenge that drugs create for us. And we know that well over half the murders um, that have been committed in the last year have got some drug related element to them, whether the perpetrator or the victim is uh, involved in drugs, dealing drugs or has some connection to gangs. But it isn't only drugs, I have to say. There is a real fear when I talk to young people about what is going on. Young people are very, very uh, clued into the news, to media. It surrounds us all the time, doesn't it? And we see pictures of knives, of young lives lost. Um, and that does fuel a fear. So people might not be directly involved in, in gang violence or directly be seeing things, but actually because they think, oh, other, it's happening out there, I need to carry a weapon to protect myself. And I can't tell you how many times myself and my officers and my colleagues have heard that I carried a knife to, to protect myself. And then often that becomes that knife they end up stabbing someone with because they get involved in an interaction where previously they might have, punched someone or had fisticuffs actually now they're resorting to violence themselves or actually that knife gets turned in on them so there's a real fear that that is driving young people to to carry knives as well that they are afraid which is a terrible terrible thing for our young people to be living with and I think social media also has, has a, a price to pay. Social media is a wonderful, wonderful tool. It allows us to do things like this, this webinar. It allows us research, contact, communication, better intelligence and understanding and education than ever before. But it's also a tool that young people and gangs are using to, to sell their drugs. Who, who believes that you could use WhatsApp to, to buy and sell, purchase, publish your menu of drugs and buy it over WhatsApp? All of these encrypted phones allow the drug gangs to do their work. So the social media platforms allow disputes to take place, fast time antagonism and corruption. So it, it's, it's really allowed a platform for violence to, to promulgate very, very quickly. I, I can think of one particular terrible murder that happened here in Bedfordshire where um, a, a, a DJ posted a, a song on YouTube criticizing another gang and literally within a few hours that gang had seen that post and that young man had been stabbed was stabbed to death in the street and that's not the only occasion that, that sort of um, social media posting has prompted such violence but what wraps all of this together for me is vulnerability we now understand vulnerability much better now and and if you look at what young people are experiencing, their own mental health issues, mental health issues within their family or their carers, lots of family strain due to sort of poverty, austerity, um, domestic abuse within households, uh, learning difficulties, many, many areas. And if we look at the next slide that, that was um, I've borrowed from the Children's Commissioner's report, they did, the Children's Commissioner did a great deal of work around understanding children in gangs and, and their vulnerability to being exploited by gangs. And nearly 300,000 children have got some sort of association or knowledge of gangs. And that's a, probably a very conservative uh, estimate. So if we look at these young people, they're getting drawn into criminality. They're either through being a victim or actually they're being bullied and coerced and co-opted into running drugs carrying weapons, getting involved in fights, and then they have the stigma of a criminal record. And they're very vulnerable to that continuing. And, and some of them, they can't really find a way out. So we've got this duality of role, this victim and this perpetrator role. Again, very unusual phenomenon that we haven't seen before in policing. So I think it's really, really important that we do understand all of these particular areas so we can do something about it. That's the most important thing. What do we do as responsible adults, let alone public servants, government officials, charity workers, everyone working in this sector with a desire and a passion to make the lives of our young people better and improve their life chances? So if we look at the, um, the 2018 uh, government strategy um, regarding serious violence, it's pinned on some really important pillars of early intervention, law enforcement and partnership and communities and also dealing with drugs and county lines. And the government have actually put a considerable amount of uh, investment towards policing. A hundred million pounds was given towards policing to look at enforcement. 
we do need to deal with the most serious crime. We do need to arrest people. We do need to protect victims. Um, and that's what we've been doing. 18 police forces that have the highest rates of um, hospital admissions for, for young people under 25 were given this money to, to deal with hotspots policing. So that's analysing where we think our, our most violent places are and actually putting resources to, to actually trying to stop and prevent crime before it happens. Weapons sweeps, better use of technology, better use of forensics so we can investigate things faster and get things through the court process faster. So there is an absolute place for enforcement but it's not the answer of its own, in and of its own, I should say. Because for me, in my opinion, what will give long and sustained change is the voice of communities, the voice of partnerships, working together with our police to protect our young people and tackle that um, violence and exploitation. So how are we doing that? The most important, I think, uh, weapon in this uh, fight against serious violence is the formation of violence reduction units and there are 18 funded violence reduction units we're very fortunate to have one here in Bedfordshire which I'll talk about in a moment and they are partnership units um, led by police and crime commissioners or um, local authorities but involve many many partners from probation children's social care mental health and it's about having a whole systems approach understanding locally what is the problem what are our communities telling us what are our young people telling us what is stopping them um, achieving their goals and um, what how can we prevent them being exploited how are we learning the lessons of those young people that have been brought into crime and i know you'll hear a great presentation by sheldon um, thomas later around his journey through gang membership and how he came out the other side how can we learn those lessons and, and embed them in schools if I think about what's happened during COVID, the drugs markets are so flexible. We know that actually, even through lockdown, they've been operating. They have been exploiting. These people have been exploiting our young people, putting them in high visibility vests in car parks so, they, so that they're not necessarily getting stopped or look, looked at being suspicious. So they've been able to carry their activity during this pandemic. So we as partnerships and communities need to work together and be as flexible as some of these markets to ensure that we're supporting and listening to our young people, giving them the education, the skills and the opportunities so that they can turn their backs against criminality or if they're involved in criminality, they can have a platform and a helping hand to get out and stay out. Out. That's the most important thing. Bedfordshire Violence um, and Exploitation Reduction Unit is a really special project um, to me. I was involved in the very beginning um, and we have looked at how we deal with uh, violence and exploitation because it's the exploitation that's the key. And we've supported over 1,200 people, 40 uh, special projects that we've um, supported with all of our partners through the PCC, um, police, social care, mental health services, you name it. We've got so many amazing people uh, working together with this project. And what's worked really well and, and what ties it into today's webinar is that we've worked with Embrace, this amazing charity that supports young people that have suffered the most serious um, violence and crime. And um, through Embrace, we have a number of workers called uh, Youth Intervention Specialists that are specially commissioned to work with families, so with parents, with carers, and the young people themselves to have a very, very bespoke service. And I'm really proud that we're working with about 70 young people uh, to give them and help them themselves be empowered to achieve better lives. So in summary, I think I would say that I'm really, really grateful for everyone's attendance today. We have a responsibility as, as adults within our communities, as well as professionals within our own careers, to, to work together to, to understand these drivers of crime and to put it front and foremost of all of our priorities. It's about leadership at whatever level, whether it's at my level or at the frontline level, we are all leaders and we can all make a change if we stick to our agendas, stick to our values and put our young people our young people's safety, their life chances and their futures at the very centre of what we do. So thank you for listening and do enjoy the rest of the sessions. Hi, um, my name is Sheldon Thomas. Um, I'm a former gang member. 
Um, I'm also a consultant for Gangs Line. Um, the work of Gangs Line is one of the things we do most is we try to employ former gang members, people that have lived that lifestyle. So that's what makes Gangs Line a little bit unique um, in that sense. Um, we have been around for a very long time, uh, but not in the same format. We, um, we kind of developed as the years went by. We started out first as an outreach um, team. We um, went into areas that most statutory and other organizations um, wouldn't go. Um, we went into places, what you call today trap houses, um, and you also call it bandos. This is, the, this is a place where young men um, would make the drugs, um, store their weapons, um, and, and bring the young people in to um, get their drugs to go out and do the county lines. I'll talk a little bit about that. So we did a lot of street work um, over the years from about 2007 to about 2014, we were engaging gang members in places like Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, um, Cambridgeshire, Essex, London. Um, we went all, all over the country because one of the things we realised at Gangs Line is that gangs was not unique to London. I know people wanted to believe that in the early days, but for us as former gang members, we knew that um, gangs was a UK problem. And also like to stress that London has a unique problem in comparison to most probably other cities apart from Birmingham, where most of the gang members in London and Birmingham are young black kids um, and Asian kids in Birmingham. Um, but across the UK, most of the gang members are white kids um, who have been recruited by a certain amount of um, older gang members. Um, so we need to understand that gangs is a UK problem. And whilst London and Birmingham may have a unique situation around young black men and Asian boys, um, we do have to understand and reliterate to everybody that it's not just young black kids, it's everyone's involved. We even got kids who are from middle class background, such as from places like Milton Keynes, um, Oxford, Gloucestershire, Reading, um, Cambridgeshire. So there are gang members who are from all different kind of classes. So we kind of have to tackle this differently. So when we talk about disrupting and diverting gang culture um, to prevent the rise of knife crime, I think we need to look at it as a bigger picture to that because it's not just about disrupting, but it's actually about changing the mindset of the society that we have become. And, and I'll go into that a little bit more. So we, we, the next slide, I wanted to really show you how young these guys are. This is a gang from Liverpool. And Liverpool is up north, for those who don't know. And this area is called Crocsteff. Now, Crocsteff is about, I don't know, 85% white, poor whites living in, the, in these communities. And it's one of the at that, at when this picture was taken, it's one of those um, neighbourhoods that was very, very um, poor. Um, I would say it was one of the poorest um, areas I have been to in many, many years, and I've been to a lot. And this area called Crocsteth has a lot of gangs, and this was just one of them. Now, as you can see in this picture, they look very young. And I'm going to tell you there, actually, the person that, um, the arrow is pointing to. I'm hoping you can see the arrow. Maybe you can't. But the person nearest to us and the picture on your right, I'm hoping the picture is on your right, um, with the face covered, he was 12. I think he was about 11 or 12. He had a 9 millimeter gun when I saw him. The picture on the left is his crew selling crack cocaine in broad daylight. None of those young people on the left in the picture selling crack cocaine were older than 12. Every single one of them that I met on that time had no fathers whatsoever. They were either in jail, dead, or they didn't know where they were. And I stress that point because I think sometimes we miss out on that. We, we, don't, put, we don't think about that because a lot of people like to think, well, you know, we don't want to blame 
uh, single parents as the reason why we're in this mess. We're not doing that. Where I am showing you that there is a correlation between young men with no fathers and young women with no fathers and their behavior. There is a pattern that we cannot miss out on. We, we cannot ignore. And this is not to say that a vast majority of women who raise children on their own are doing a bad job. That is not what we're saying. But we cannot ignore the correlation, the pattern that I see going across the UK. And what we have to also look at is the role of social media. It's really sad that with all this technology that we have, unfortunately, gets misused by a minority of young people. And unfortunately, this picture just shows you one of them. This young man is a, is a, a gang member from East London. Um, I think in this picture, and, and I was told by somebody that knew this person that, that was a, he had about £60,000 he had made from selling drugs. And what we have to understand is, have a look at that picture. What does it tell you? It tells you that these guys are prepared to put their pictures up on Instagram to entice young people into believing that you can make this money. You can make this money. Look at how I'm living. But what that picture doesn't tell you is that this young man can't leave his house on his own. He has to walk with a gun. He has to walk with at least five or six other guys because he has to be protected. He can't leave and go into certain neighborhoods because if he goes there, hots or rival gangs will, will attack him. He can't go to his parents' house because if the rival gangs find out where his mum lives, they will kick the door, kick, kick her door off. So this guy is actually living in a prison. But the picture does not tell you that. What the picture tells you, it makes you believe that this guy's got it going on. That look at him, he's 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 flush, he's flush with money, he's got the he's got the diamonds, he's got the clothes. But actually, the truth is, this guy can't even sleep at night. He can't go anywhere. So we have to understand that young people, when they see this picture, and I'm speaking to young people, I'm hopefully young people will be looking at this. You've got to understand those pictures don't tell you the truth. They are telling you a lie and giving you a misrepresentation of the fact that this young man is making money, but he actually can't do much with it because he has to, he's living in total fear. And the pictures try to give you an impression that he's not. We also need to look at what does a gang member look like? What does it look like? Well, let's have a look at that. That is what a gang member looks like. I know we've got this image of a young black kid or a mixed race kid or some a kid from a poor white community with a weapon, um, with um, a bore a knife or with a nine millimeter gun or a Glock or a baseball bat, um, looking mean and angry. That's an image. The real issue is the, psycho the, the psychological issues going on up here, the mindset. That's why I call it gang mentality. And we need to understand this is what a real gang member looks like. A vast majority of gang, in fact, I'll go one further. A vast majority of adults in the UK have suffered from some of these issues, let alone a young man who's come from a house where um, domestic violence is, is, is a regular, is a normal lifestyle. And on top of domestic violence, seeing a murder, seeing his friend stabbed, seeing um, his, um, um, a girl seeing um, her friend being raped, um, a girl being sexually abused, a girl being forced to sell drugs, a girl being forced to hold weapon. These are some of the stuff they go through on a daily basis. And unfortunately, we don't have um, a mental health service capable of addressing these issues because the people that they have, um, the psychologists they have, the therapists they have cannot relate to these people. And that's a problem because if we want to address the issue of disrupting gangs and diverting young people, then we've got to change the people we're recruiting to do that very job.
And this is not a dig at people who can't relate to these, these, these young people. But this is like we've got to address the whole society as a whole to say if we want to disrupt gangs, if we want to change the way young people um, think about gangs, if we want to change the narrative then we've got to change the people that's going to be addressing it. And the only way we can do that is from the top. They've got to understand that this is not the norm and what we need are specialists. Um, and so if you look at that list, go down that list and ask yourself when you go down that list, did you ever suffer from one of those things? I guarantee you could have. I'm going to put myself on the line and tell you straight, I suffered from a lot of that from there. In fact, I'd say most of it. Why? Because when you've seen murders like I have or you've been shot at like I have, those things are not easy to get rid of. You can remove a bullet. You can so stitch up a stab wound. But the psychological issues, some of the mental health issues, cannot be dealt with that quickly. And it took me years to adjust and understand that I had mental health issues. Years. And why? I'm going to be, again, going to the colour thing. Many uh, people in the black community, we don't believe in the mental health. We didn't at that time. We believe this was another way of, 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 uh, of this country trying to keep us down. That's what we believed back then. I'm not saying that is the case today, but back then, black people didn't believe in that. So I didn't know, I didn't even know I had these issues until I started learning from um, some of my mentors like Bernie Grant and Jesse Jackson. Those were my mentors back in the day. It was then I began to realise those were my issues. So when I show you this slide, this is the crux of the matter. Because until we can address this as a society, the mental health issues of not just young people, but of adults. And it clearly says that in the attachment theory. Clearly says that. It clearly says if the parent or the guardian um, do not address their issues, then it's likely that the issues they have will be passed down to their children. And these are the things I think sometimes we don't get. We don't understand that it's important for us to deal with our issues as adults so that our children can be free from that lifestyle or can be free to live a, a more balanced life. It's really important. So what I'm going to go on to now, because I know time's against me, I'm going to go on to some solutions because obviously it's not good to just talk about what the problem is. It's now time to talk about the solutions. And unfortunately, my solutions are going to be different to everyone else's. We need to address um, absent fathers in a very large, in a very big way on a national, national level. We have to start looking at that. Now, what do I mean by addressing fathers in um, on a national level. I'm saying let's do a media campaign. Let's go into the schools, in secondary schools. Instead of just teaching young people about sex education, we should add to that and teach them about what does it mean when you get a girl pregnant at 14? Because that's where the problem lies. We're not teaching young men and women what a relationship means because what happens is young men um, entice these girls into um, having sex with them. And the minute the girl tells them I'm pregnant, they're gone. So we have to address that nationally, that there's no color in this. This is a national problem. We also need to look at um, a, a, a parents campaign, a national parents campaign to educate parents on the negative social media images and videos. So one of the things I'm talking about is the YouTube videos that literally promote gangster lifestyle. And it also promotes videos that degrade women. So again, we have videos that is perpetuating um, this, this violent lifestyle and perpetuating the, to, how to mistreat women sexually. So we have to address that in a national campaign. We also need to look at policies that um, are going to address racial and social inequality in the UK with a focus on black youth and poor white communities. Because at the moment, we're not focused on um, social inequality. We've only mentioned it because of the Black Lives Matter. And that's not good enough because we have to start looking at these poor white communities up north because if we don't, the chances are 
these young people up north who are from these poor white communities like Norris Green, Croxteth, um, Salford in Manchester, will be drawn in to far right groups. And we cannot ignore that. That's going to be the next step. Because what we have to understand, there is a transition from gangs into radicalization, whether it be into terrorist groups or whether it be into far right groups. We also need to look at um, addressing the lack of black people um, and, and, and um, black people f- um, and, and, and people from poor white backgrounds at board level. Again, if you're a young person in a school in a poor deprived area, whether you be black or white, and you can't see yourself in society, what do you think that young person's going to do? They're not going to feel like they're a part of this society. If we can't see ourselves in top jobs, if we can't see ourselves at the top as a chief executive in local executives, in the local authority, or the NHS, or the police, or the fire service, if we can't see ourselves in those top positions, and we only see ourselves in the lower positions, what do you think young people are going to do, whether they be black or white? They're going to turn elsewhere. And guess what? Gangs don't see colour. Gangs are most probably the best employers. Why? Because gang members don't care if you're black, white, fat, female, Asian. If you can sell drugs for them, they will pay you money. Now, not every gang will pay you big money. But if a gang member does come up to you, like what's happened in East London, where um, a young boy, I think he was about 11, um, was told, like, I'll give you £50 a day if you can if you can shift this. He took it. So he's, make, he's making, like, Three, four hundred pounds, three, three, three hundred, three hundred and fifty pounds a week, tax free, 11 years old. Bringing in more money because his mum don't work, he hasn't got a dad. He's not going to say no. Especially if you go to a, a kid who's 14, 15, and he's about to leave school in a year or so, and he can't see himself fitting into society. She can't see herself fitting because she can't see a representation of her. Then, of course, they're going to be attracted to what they believe will make them some money. So again, we have to address um, the lack of black people and people from poor white communities um, on board and senior executive positions throughout this country. We also need to look at um, senior executives who refuse to acknowledge systemic racism. Because if they can't acknowledge systemic racism, then nothing's going to change and we're still going to have gangs. Because it's going to take the people at the top to acknowledge that systemic racism exists in order for change to happen. So these are the things we have to look at in this country. We also need to develop a vision for children. The government has to develop a vision for children. If you can't develop a vision for children, then children are just going to school, are just going to school with no hope. We have to have a vision that shows them job prospects, not jobs that's gonna pay them five pound an hour, not apprenticeships that's going to give them seven pounds an hour, but real jobs that's going to allow them to move up the corporate ladder or the local authority ladder without any fear of discrimination. We have to create that. We have to. And the only way to do that is that that's at government level, a vision that goes right across the UK, that doesn't look at colour, that doesn't look at gender, that doesn't look at um, whether you're from some poor community in Croxteth or from Brixton. It, it, it addresses fairness. That means equal distribution of job prospects in this country. We also need to develop new policies around social media, because at the moment we've got no new policies. We don't have the policies that really should be effective around super, um, social media because social media are not made accountable. We cannot have a social media that allows images that degrade women, that allow images of this gangster lifestyle, this violent music that conditions young people's mindset into believing, into believing that they're going to be the next um, uh, um the next Don, the next bad man, the next drug dealer, Kingpin. We've got to get rid of that. So that means we have to make um, social media much more accountable. So we need a policy that's going to, imp- that will make those changes, those tangible changes. For me, 
unless society changes, which is the underlying reasons why young people feel, uh, feel inferior, especially if you're black and you're from some poor white community, we don't feel a part of this society. They don't feel a part of this society. And what makes it worse? They don't feel loved at home. If they don't feel loved at home, they're going to lo look for love elsewhere. And when they look for love elsewhere, because they don't understand what love is, they get attracted to these criminal elements. I'm hoping to any questions and uh, um, any questions you may have. That's my details there. I'm really um, happy to have taken part in this um, webinar. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Anne Campbell and the Chief Executive of Embrace. Together with my colleagues, we're on a mission to provide support to the many thousands of children every year who find themselves a victim of crime. I think of these children as the hidden victims. Most of them are not the direct victims of crime, but those who have witnessed it happening or who have been traumatised, disadvantaged or just plain frightened as a result of criminal activity involving the adults in their family or within their sphere. We've already heard how domestic abuse impacts on children and is much more common than most of us realise, and that the trend in online exploitation is for younger and younger girls. Truly shocking. But turning to today, and our focus uh, is on uh, violent crime. One of the most poignant photographs that I was sent recently at first looked pretty ordinary. Then I looked again. The beaming young boy was clutching a cushion to his chest. And on that cushion was a montage of photographs that I could see all featured just one person. It was this boy's dad. He'd been brutally killed on the doorstep of his home somewhere in Yorkshire. I can't remember the exact circumstances because there are no consequence now. What actually matters is this little boy. In the aftermath of the murder, he couldn't sleep. He was desperately missing his dad. This little boy was referred to Embrace. And after discussions with the family, it was decided that one of the things that we could do as some pra immediate practical support was to create a personalised cushion that he could cuddle when he went to bed. Regardless of any other help and support we're providing for this little boy to start the process of recovery from the trauma that happened at his own front door, I know that this simple intervention has made a big difference to him. He can hug the memory of his dad. His dad will never be forgotten. And I have to tell you, this story did make us cry. Sadly, this is only one of a myriad of stories that we can tell about how our style of support, personalised and tailored to individuals, really does make the difference to children who suffered trauma, whether they are victims themselves, witnesses of crime, or suffer as a result of what has happened to a close member, family member or friend. So, what do we do and where do we operate? Ch Embrace Child Victims of Crime operates across England and Wales primarily and also in Scotland when funding allows. We believe that no child needing help or support as a result of a crime should have to be on a wait list and that services to support them should be readily available. We know the benefits of early intervention. We need to provide support before the problems that can dog mental and physical health get out of hand. We also believe that in order to best support, we need to offer a range of services that include practical help, if family finances are tight, and I can tell you they often are, as well as emotional support or our trauma-focused trauma specialist counselling. A trademark of Embrace's support is this tailored, personalised approach. It is often a mix of our services that helps a child or young person to put the past behind them. I'm very proud of a number of our former beneficiaries who have turned their lives around. They are inspirational to others who may be in similar positions to when they were um, suffering. And I applaud the voluntary work of those who fly our flag, not least our own trustee and ambassador, Rhys Dickinson, who overcame great um, struggles in his life to become the well-balanced, successful young man he is today. The fact that he was also part of our trek to Everest Base Camp last November, fundraising mission, was amazing. 
Those who would like to share his this adventure can do so by watching the captivating film that was produced by the film crew that accompanied our trekkers. Uh-huh. It's currently on Amazon Prime for those who subscribe, and it's not for the faint-hearted. I can tell you that Dr. Nick, our Trek doctor, was kept quite busy. Disrupting patterns of unhealthy behaviour. We at Embrace believe that the earlier we can support a child needing help, the better. Increasingly, the demand is for talking therapies, everything from someone to chat to or download to, to full sessions of trauma-focused CBT counselling for those who have more complex issues. I should say at this point, the most complex cases often involve families and siblings and are referred to to the statutory services. But the majority of the children we support, in our experience, need the lower levels of support to safeguard their mental health. Our case studies and work to date suggest that by providing the most appropriate early support, there is much more chance of that child finding the coping strategies that will preclude the need for further more expensive help down the line. Childhood experiences can change the course of their lives and ruin potential, which is why our work is so important. We need to change those patterns of unhealthy behaviour, and that's what we do. As we heard from Floella in our opening webinar, childhood really does last a lifetime. When we first launched our trauma-focused cognitive behavioural therapy programmes, we noticed that some children were exiting the service earlier than we anticipated. They were demonstrating that they had got what they needed from the opportunity to talk to a non-judgmental person who offered a caring ear in an entirely confidential setting. As proud as I am of Reese and others who have successfully completed counselling or received emotional support from our specialists, I am equally proud of those who have changed their lives by other means. Again, sometimes it is the simple things that make a difference. I'm thinking about the fishing rod we recently bought for a teenager and the guitar and lessons that was bought for another. Small interventions in their way, but enormous in the role they played to help these young people find a new focus and a new lease of life. It made the difference. It has to be said, Embrace is special. We are constantly improving our services and raising money to ensure we can offer help and support to as many young victims harmed by crime as possible. We are commissioned by some enlightened police and crime commissioners who know our true worth. There are several counties where we complement existing services for young victims. Key is that we use our voluntary fundraise income in that area to augment those services, meaning we're able to do so much more and offer so much more. A key principle is that we ring fence all income raised to be spent in that county, area or region in which it was raised. We've got increasingly good at this and I find that talking to police and crime commissioners, it goes down well when I tell them that if they support us, we will organise fundraising and corporate uh, fundraising efforts in their area to match fund their input. Now that can't be bad. Our income profile, it has to be said, is changing. Most of our income used to come from voluntary fundraising and corporate supporters. But we're increasingly now seeking to be commissioned uh, for our work. We know what works and our partners who help brighten the lives of many children are awesome. I'm thinking about Merlin's Magic Wand who allow us to distribute hundreds thousands of family tickets for all the major theme parks in the country and the principal trusts who allow our families who need to heal themselves to enjoy lodge holidays in the lake in the lake district i understand the little boy i mentioned earlier will be taking his cushion to cumbria sometime soon the pandemic has seen fundraising fall sharply and the focus forecast for the immediate future is not too bright But we have plans to survive and we believe that by working in partnership with organisations that can help us to deliver our personalised packages of support, we will continue and thrive. We're working with Nicola Lester, a trauma psychologist, who we'll hear from tomorrow, about how we are incorporating her SENSE model to become a trauma-informed organisation very soon and bolstering our team with specialists to deliver phone and online talking therapies and counselling to children harmed by crime 
across the country. <laughs> Difficult times they may be, but it's exciting and cha always challenging. I always believed that you need to develop an ability to look round corners in order to see the future. This may not have helped us to forecast COVID-19, but we are doing our level best to brighten the lives of so many children harmed by crime. Thank you so much for listening. Wow, I can imagine lots of questions for our speakers today. So over to you, Anne, for some of the answers. Well, hello everyone and uh, thanks for joining us on another stupendous uh, webinar. I was blown away by the presentations uh, uh, by Jackie Sabir and uh, Sheldon Thomas. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we've got many, many comments coming in uh, supporting uh, uh, them both. Um, Jackie, they want to hear much more from you and uh, Sheldon is uh, being described as uh, inspirational. So. Great feedback. Thanks very much. Now, because of the length of our webinar today, we haven't got uh, time to take the questions live. Um, but what we will do is uh, get back to our questioners uh, who've emailed us. And I know Jackie and uh, uh, Sheldon and myself will be happy to do that. Thanks uh, once again to our sponsor, our series sponsor, Slater and Gordon. And uh, to all of you who have listened, do join us again tomorrow for the final uh, in our current series. Many thanks all. Bye for now.